lesson from uh, yesterday's work in which we tried to showcase the overall view of some of the work that we've been doing in the project. And also, of course, um, it was an opportunity to dig into some of the work um, that we've done within the various work streams. Today, we continue um, and very um, excitingly, we have um, a, an engaged discussion now um, that really focuses on policy options and fiscal recovery in Asia. Um, I'm delighted to have my uh, colleague from the Regional Commission, Shivajit Banerjee, um, present today, and he's going to chair this session um, and introduce the uh, speakers. Um, he is an economic affairs officer at SCAP and has been um, really an exceptionally helpful um, and thoughtful um, contributor to the project. And um, I welcome him and thank you as I welcome you. Uh, thank you very much, Penelope. So um, let me just uh, give some brief details about what SCAP in Asia Pacific has done in, in terms of this project. Um, so we targeted three countries and um, which were Samoa, Kyrgyzstan, and of course, what we'll discuss today, which is Pakistan, um, where uh, the initial idea was to have a sort of um, uh, a rapid assessment of the, um, uh, the fiscal policy needs coming out of um, uh, the COVID crisis. So that was about a year ago. And then um, what to focus on uh, pretty uh, much more, I mean, uh, that's our, uh, would be to, uh, as we look at recovery policies, um, how, we, how we can keep the focus on the SDGs um, in terms of fiscal policies. So while we have, a, of course, an initial look at growth and now, of course, inflation as well due to the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, but uh, we don't lose the long-term focus. And so um, we at SCAP have a macroeconomic tool which um, allows governments to to look at the SDG um, sort of implications of their fiscal spending. And that's what we've been um, sort of uh, highlighting to two countries. And so uh, in this case today, um, we, we highlighted it to Pakistan as well. And we've had a great cooperation with them, um, the Pakistan uh, government and the think tank community. And um, there has been interest. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, that's a very positive aspect of this, that to help the government in um, using this tool to, uh, uh, well, to look further at um, uh, how, how to integrate SDG needs into, into their fiscal policy planning. Um, it's, a, it's a somewhat complex uh, tool. It's not, I mean, uh, too difficult, but um, it needs some training, and and that's what we are now engaging with the government of Pakistan in, in capacity building, um, in terms of the federal ministries as and as well, and the regional um, provincial ministries as well, to offer some um, capacity building and how to actually use this tool to help their uh, policy planning. So um, we have worked very closely with. Um, uh, the Sustainable De Development Policy Institute of Pakistan, which is the uh, SDPI, and through them with the Planning Ministry of uh, Pakistan, um, to, uh, the SDG unit uh, specifically of the Planning Ministry. Um, and um, well, uh, let me let me turn it over to my colleague and uh, and uh, uh, let Mr. Sajid Anmin uh, explain more about. Uh, the work that we've done in Pakistan and the implications and um, oh, what the potential benefits are for the for the government. Thank you. Thank you. Should, should I start? Uh, yes, please. Oh, great. So let, let me just share the screen and I'll be um, then. I hope you can see my slides. Great. Uh, let me start by thanking UNCTAD, UNESCAP, and all the colleagues, those who have been very instrumental you know, in taking up this work. Uh, so so the broadly, uh, the work 
uh, you know it, it it covers uh fiscal policies for sustainable recovery from covid-19 the key focus was on uh, fiscal recovery options constraints and proposals and and i i would just like to highlight how important this topic was actually when it uh, came we started working on it uh, that pakistan has a very unique case compared to other developing countries when the covid-19 hit pakistan uh, we were already under very contractionary monetary and fiscal policies due to imf program that pakistan was having had under uh, uh, imf uh to correct its balance of payment crisis so so just to sort of a fiscal assessment fiscal options and providing some sort of avenues possible proposals where pakistan can uh, mobilize financing resources was very critical and that, i think that was one of the reason that uh, the solicitation for this work came from the highest office that was the pakistan's prime minister office so that this work was solicited by the prime minister office of pakistan actually so overall just to give a quick summary uh, this work done three major dimensions actually uh, assesses the socio economic impact of covid-19 and pakistan's fiscal stimulus response to the pandemic uh, it further evaluates the degree to which it has managed to support a recovery which is inclusive green and forward looking these were three key uh, dimensions that we were focusing while assessing pakistan's fiscal recovery and and we assessed how fiscal stimulus to what extent it was aligned to support this uh, recovery but most importantly uh, as as i already highlighted uh, this work assesses fiscal space and suggest possible venues for mobilizing financial financing a uh, recovery from covid-19 that was the difficult task and pakistan continues to face it we are still struggling with the fiscal space issues and sixth and seventh revenue review of imf is we are still waiting uh, to go it positively so that uh, more or less this work remains so far the first of its kind which really brings such a uh, in depth analysis of recovery Uh, how to align it with sdgs agenda where the fiscal space can come from and in in terms of capacity building that shobhajit also highlighted i'll be highlighting in in a moment so this so far remains the first of its uh, work uh, two major contributions i think that that this work has made in pakistan so far is uh, that it really clearly identifies the estimated costs and proposes sources and venues of possible financing options and that is very critical for pakistan given the fiscal space issues and secondly uh, i think this is the uh, first work which really proposes a sort of provides a macroeconomic model uh, as a tool uh, which public sector which government which private sector even can use sort of the scenario buildings to see the final impact of uh, investments made in uh, be it social protection be it vaccination be it uh, other uh, venues so uh, given the fiscal limitation fiscal space the government was really eyeing to have some sort of uh, models while it has already many models but this is particularly which really is aligned uh, with the recovery from covid-19 so this was uh, this remained the first model uh, that is Uh, we are providing and then finally it it provides a sort of though we we are still lot more to go but we have already started work on uh, capacity building of public sector to design and implement evidence based policies uh, for sustainable recovery from uh, covid-19 and again uh, this is uh, the one work uh, based on the evidence we really have been able uh, to sort of build any make a case for social protection and so one reason i think we we, we believe is that uh, the the case for social spending was not built in an economic language i mean the economic case for social spending was not particularly for the social protection so social policy social spending remain pakistan as a residual spending or as a residual policy i think the sort of the engagements and the dissemination of this work uh, that we have been very closely working with the, uh, the the relevant departments and ministries i'll be just showing you in a while it has sort of debate started a debate kind of on the economic case for social protection or generally you can say economic case for investing in people which has largely remain uh, ignored so these are couple of the major contributions that we have made uh, the major outputs if if we see the model uh, of the work that we have done with unescap with the support of unctad that we have been able to deliver 
the first is the UNISCAP SDPI macro model. Uh, and this is likely to be placed in three ministries as a decision making tool uh, for, for aligning uh, sort of a recovery from COVID-19 with SDGs agenda. Yeah, we will be having a capacity building workshop with the federal SDGs unit of Ministry of Planning Reforms, Planning and Development and Special Initiatives in August, most probably. I'll be giving some details on this one. And then the capacity building uh, workshops that we delivered and still a couple of are in, in pipeline. We, we have been able to in first of our capacity building workshop, we have been able to sort of uh, engage 30 participants from a large number of ministries that I'll be showing you at the end. Those who, who are willing to take this model uh, to their uh, ministries and use it as a decision-making sort of tool. Uh, in terms of publications, we are able to uh, deliver two working papers uh, from this. Both are published, both are online, available at UNESCAPS. I'll be uh, providing the link in, in a while. Uh, and, and particularly we were able to develop, uh, STPI was able to develop a network of sort of secretaries, ministers, and the departments uh, around this discussion and, and to create an enable environment where evidence-based policy making for uh, recovery from COVID-19 is. I'll be giving you the just quick uh, slides on this one that what are the initiatives that we have been able to generate. Uh, a couple of the major impacts uh, is uh, like, I, I have already covered this one that it has really promoted evidence-based uh, culture for uh, uh, sort of uh, recovery from COVID-19. It has sort of been able to capacity building of, and there is now we, we are receiving uh, one is aligned, I mean, uh, sort of uh, to be held in August. We are also having requests for two more capacity buildings for two different ministries to use that model, to use this evidence that is uh, sort of, so, so this was the impact, uh, the capacity building and, and other. And, 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 and on a lighter note, I have a one personal impact from this as well, uh, that this uh, word work and the word around, it helped me to sort of get the an opportunity to be the global uh, lead on a state of SDGs report of Southern Wise. So I, I just thought to, in any way of thanking you to, to uh, give me this work and we were able to. So this uh, report is also, we are working on this one with Southern Wise. Uh, but to me, I think, you know, there is a status quo in developing countries and it uh, it's really difficult to break in a couple of months or a couple of years. But at least this work in terms of medium to long-term impacts, it has created three very crucial debates uh, that I think UNCTAD, SDPI, UNESCAP can continue to build on. We will continue to build on from SDPI. The one is that the macroeconomic policies need to have a social content. The divorce between micro policy and the social policy needs to go the, the COVID-19 challenged this, uh, this separation. Uh, and in case of Pakistan, we were really able to produce that evidence that how investing and in people can bring you a larger economic gains in terms of GDP growth, in terms of reducing poverty, in terms of promoting inequality, I mean, promoting employment, reducing inequality. So the first debate that we are in Pakistan, in SDPI is closely engaging, uh, that social side of economy is intrinsically linked with the economic and police I'm sorry I think we're losing you I I'm wondering if perhaps we could ask you to just remove your video and then perhaps we can just listen to the sound might improve it okay let let me let me know please Yes, maybe just give me. Okay, can I let me just uh, reshare my screen as well, stopping the video first, and then uh, maybe you can hear me more. Can you hear me now a bit clear? Is it okay now? I, it's it's not breaking up, so I think that's oh, good. excellent. Excellent. So I was just quickly uh, that there are some uh, in, in, in addition to what tangible 
macro model and other things we have been able to deliver and make impact on capacity building. This work has also added a medium to long-term impacts. Uh, the first is that creating a debate on social content and macro policies, uh, that social side of economy is intrinsically linked with the economic policy. And we are receiving demand from the government and from other sectors to sort of start a debate and dialogue on policies for economic justice, particularly in terms of the taxation for economic justice or taxation for development. So this is uh, the one uh, medium to long to impact on, on this one. Uh, secondly, I think the, 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 uh, the model or uh, the work that the evidence we have produced was able to show uh, that investment in people is central to a long-term sustainable recovery and social spendings, uh, seriously low levels of uh, in Pakistan are to be boosted up. And now the, the, even the present government uh, is having uh, sort of a good focus on social spending. Uh, the social spending are emerging as a central. We, we couple of weeks, we had a meeting with uh, Minister for uh, Social Protection and Social Safety Nets uh, the Shazi Ammari, they're also asking us to arrange for them an orientation workshop and a capacity building workshop to use the evidence produced in this work uh, for the BISP, Benzir Income Support Program. And finally, uh, I think another impact that we were able to generate through this work was uh, redistributive policies are critical to share an inclusive recovery. Uh, so this was some of the uh, medium to long-term impacts that this work has been able to generate. Uh, finally, uh, the, the kind of, you know, whenever you have to change the policy sort of landscape or some policy interventions, uh, this work has been able to uh, earn a very strong political ownership uh, from the day one, as I told that it initiated on the solicitation from the prime minister office. Uh, we had then very close engagements with three relevant ministries. The one is the for the green recovery part. Uh, we, we were invited by a special advisor of, on prime, of prime minister on climate change, uh, Malak Amin Aslam, uh, to, to sort of present to his office uh, that how the findings of this work can promote a case for green investments. And he, he took the sort of the summary to the then prime minister office, uh, Mr. Khan's uh, office. And we were really close to have an MOU with Ministry of Climate Change to build on this work, uh, that there was a change of government. But we have already started approaching uh, the new Minister on Climate Change. And, and we are hoping to have an MOU to sort of uh, increase the uptake of this work in the Ministry of uh, Climate Change. Uh, we are also the one of the strongest parties partnership I think that that we have been able to develop and I think that was the most critical was uh, with the uh, federal SDGs unit of Ministry of Planning Development and Special Initiatives. Uh, we have been very closely working with uh, the chief SDGs Mr. Ali Kamal and his uh, unit uh, to sort of align recovery uh, from COVID-19 with the SDGs agenda. Actually, Ali Kamal uh, overlooks all the uh, SDGs uh, agenda policies in Pakistan. So they, they have requested us uh, to arrange a capacity building workshop for the staff to use the macro model that we have developed. And we are arranging that in uh, August, uh, most probably in the first week or second week of uh, August. We're still not finalizing the delay. Uh, but but to, to on, on, on an encouraging uh, side, positive news is that the Mr. Ali Kamal and his department has sort of uh, kind of given uh, the willingness and, and the political ownership of the macro model and the evidence that we have produced. And they, they are sort of looking to use this macro model as a major tool for decision making uh, in terms of uh, implementing Pakistan's uh, SDGs agenda and aligning the recovery uh, with the agenda. And this uh, the, the strong political ownership of the work continues, as I told you, uh, that we are in very close engagements with uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, the Secretary of Finance, Dr. M. Tiaz Ahmed, who is also the economic advisor to the present government as well, uh, chaired many of our dissemination workshops and other consultations. And he has really uh, shown a keen interest in, in uh, having his this model at his ministry and a capacity building workshop as well. And finally, on political ownership, uh, I have had a meeting. We were invited for a meeting from the ministers for uh, social protection and social safety nets, uh, Ms. Shazia Mari, uh, to arrange uh, sort of a capacity building workshop and orientation workshop for the staff of this program. Uh, this is the largest 
social protection programs and it is the umbrella program and the social protection so we are thinking to promote spending in social protection uh, of people uh, so so this this really gives us a possible venues uh, to uh, increase the uptake of this work this is the sum of the ministries uh, the participants from were engaged uh, in the capacity building workshop that we have held uh, these are uh, covers almost all the uh, important ministries of federal and provincial levels federal ministry of finance federal ministry of planning and development and special initiatives federal board of revenues ministries of commerce poverty alleviation and social safety nets sdgs unit and then ministry of national health services and other provincial departments as well they they participated we we have nominations at the highest level nominations i mean the sort of we we have additional secretaries joint secretaries and the section officers uh, for this orientation workshop and capacity building workshops uh, on 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 this work so i i i think i'm just closing my time limits uh, while i can give some details on the major recommendations but i'll just give a quick summary of of this uh, policy recommendations that coming from this one and this is where we are building on our work and the pakistan must increase social spending and expand social protection uh, so, so the pakistan is Uh, coming from this evidence uh, is Sajid, I'm so sorry you're breaking up here. Um, we can read your recommendations. Um, How? Uh, but we cannot hear. Important this vaccination again. policy can. Be, uh, can you not? Sorry, go. Yes, go ahead. It sounds better. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, so the, uh, I'll, I'll just show a couple of uh, more slides and then I'll, I'll stop on, on this one. Uh, so this was some of the key recommendations that came if, if if someone interested in quick numbers. You know, the current spending, social spendings are roughly 0.6% of GDP. So the major sort of required spending minimum required spending must be 2.74% of uh, gdp so it pakistan needs 2.14% of spending of gdp uh, as an additional source the needs to create financing space for uh, this one so we have similar on increased social spending on uh, on health and education as well uh, so in 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 terms of green uh, recovery uh, pakistan needs a balanced green funding in order to ensure transition towards green and financing needs for green transportation uh, are roughly 38.5 billion if you can see the red numbers and that if if we align it with the agenda 2030 it means next uh, 7 to 10 years they need more than 3.85 billion a year so this was another we, we were able to find sort of how much it can come from the private sector and from the uh, public sector we, we we are providing the government with very clear numbers that this is where uh, where it can come from uh, policies and and then and, and, and the digitalization but i'll just go on where can the resources come from that i think were a great help to the government when we push you know if you see these charts uh, pakistan's fiscal space is likely to remain uh, the kind of limited uh, you know the trade deficit is increasing uh, tax revenues are most stagnant as a percentage of GDP. If you see the bottom slides, so the, the if you see all these fiscal indicators, they are almost sort of either worsening or remaining almost unchanged. So major question that came from the government to us was, where can these resources come from that you are recommending uh, in this work? And this was the so we were able to give five sort of key areas with very quantified numbers uh, that this is where you can increase. Uh, the resources. Uh, so let me just give you one example, given the time shortage, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop then. Uh, this is, for example, uh, we, we were able to highlight that there are, are ample resources available within the country if it, it, it better governance. For example, just if government can reduce subsidies, and based on this work and some other works, we were really able to build a very strong case for reducing 
across the board universal subsidies be it in transportation can be it in energy sector electricity sector and thanks to imf uh, that that we, we were able to this work was and some other work is as well uh, were able to sort of uh, push uh, the governments so now we are moving towards zero subsidies uh, in terms of uh, sort of petroleum price says but this is more coming from imf's pressure so even if if we see that if we can sort of reduce uh, subsidies uh even just 75% so we can have uh, around 1.4 billion dollars a year uh, coming and this is roughly uh, 25% of the total imf program that we have had of 6 billion uh, of 3 years so government can save uh, around equal to uh, yearly imf sport flows around 2 billion dollars if it can control the subsidies uh in in uh, again reducing energy and transportation sector inefficiencies uh, can sort of increase uh, financing resources for the green transportation from the sector within its sector actually and i think this was one of the key area of this work uh, that we were promoting we were sort of trying to uh, bring in the possible venues of mobilizing resources within those sectors so this really helps uh, understand uh the uh, the kind of uh, the government revenues can uh, come from and similarly there are some other uh, venues so i'll just stop here uh, that overall we were able to number one uh, earn a very good political ownership of the work that increases the uh, kind of uh, chances of uptake of this work and this is uh, this uptake is is a sort of clear from the de demands that we are receiving from different ministries for the capacity building workshop and the orientation workshops of this work um, so thank you so very much uh, i i am available for any questions please thank you um thank you so much sajid um so yeah, uh, unfortunately, well, today we, we had also planned to have uh, the representative from the um, uh, Pakistan government, uh, from the SDG's ministry, um, uh, SDG's um, unit of the planning ministry. Um, but he was unfortunately called away, so he couldn't. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, that, I think uh, Sajid can explain many of, uh, of his views. Um, as as was outlined in uh, some of his presentation, I believe today we also have another speaker to speak on other um, Asia Pacific aspects of this project. Um, uh, ah, sorry, there's a question from pa um, Pakistan. I think uh, is that from the from the mission in Pakistan? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Firstly, to the UNTAD for organizing uh, this workshop, very useful one, very pertinent to the topic and in very timely manner. Uh, there is no more uh, important discussion nowadays other than uh, how to mobilize financial resources for development. And in particular context of uh, this crisis after crisis and the challenges developing countries are facing. Of course, this study um, is, uh, is a work in progress and um, it is expanding in its scope. I, I fully understand it. And then thought in collaboration with ASCAP, ASCAP and uh, also uh, in the other uh, regional commissions, uh, they are doing very commendable work. And in Pakistan, SPPI partnered uh, with ASCAP to, to undertake this study and then of course come up with a very, very sound policy recommendations. And uh, we are very pleased to note uh, that the institutions from Pakistan, particularly the government ministries, the key government ministries um, are uh, well interested in it and responding to it. Um, we we also, Pakistan Mission in Geneva, has recently um, sent an update on this project to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to bring them in loop. We, we look towards a successful conclusion. And we also, in particularly, look towards uh, UNCTAD's contribution towards uh, the final policy recommendations. Because UNCTAD is a very unique institution. We, we look at this institution uh, uh, is one of its kind in the UN system. It is the one institution which comes uh, with a different lens. It does not see the things uh, from the generic point of view and does not come up with the very uh, hickenide and the usual routine recommendations. 
it looks at the things from a point of view which uh, really um, uh, is required at the, at the time to be seen, like from the perspective of the developing countries, what are the specific challenges of the developing countries, what are their priorities. I see that in this project, we have, of course, focused on the countries and then, of course, on their uh, specific problems, came up with certain policy recommendations, uh, coming up uh, with a certain um, macroeconomic models, and then um, trying to build capacity of the public, uh, public uh, servants and those who implemented successfully in the country. This is very good, much appreciated. Uh, but my, my concerns and my question is when I see that, of course, there are two dimensions of this whole issue. One is the, the a dimension which we call the domestic compulsions, domestic uh, uh, decisions, policies, and of course, this macroeconomic model and then micro models and this financial and fiscal policy. All these things are the domain of the national governments. Of course, this, this study is focusing on that, but also uh, there is a very wider um, uh, dimension of the whole uh, this challenge and then uh, mobilizing the financial resources for the development at the time of crisis. Uh, this also requires uh, a mobilization of resources from the international, uh, international development finance. And that is very important where I see that the role of the institutions like UNCTAD and then in particular like UNESCAP comes because we see <clears throat> that uh, uh, there are limitations with the developing countries. Pakistan is doing um, whatever it can do, of course, to come out of this crisis. But it's, it is such a uh, uh, enormity of this challenge is such a big, and then this is coming in successions, like one after the other. We are not yet out of this COVID crisis, and we are into another, the Ukraine crisis, and then increasing petroleum prices and food challenges, shortage, and then prices uh, rise. All these coming one after the other. So even the developed countries are struggling to, to face these challenges. And of course, uh, these are very useful recommendations when we look at, at these, uh, uh, at these uh, recommendations, uh, one by one, like reducing subsidies on the petroleum, coal, oil prices, very, very sound. We understand we can save uh, billions like in this uh, recommendation. I also learned that 17.69 billion alone can be saved if energy sector insufficiencies are reduced. Uh, I understand this is very, very good and uh, very sound, and, and this is evidence-based thing. But there are like some compulsions with the governments, the developing countries. These can't be done like in a one go or immediately. Uh, these are the things which which would be looked upon in the medium to long term because these are the things which will require some kind of decision. Some things are being done. Some work is in progress. Some uh, maximum possible efforts are already being undertaken. I understand we have recently removed uh, subsidies on the petroleum prices in Pakistan and all of course that are coming from the IMF and other things as well, some kind of recommendations and the conditionalities which comes with the IMF as well. But of course, um, where I am appreciating your role is the capacity building and of course lining um, the, the spending with the sustainable uh, development, like how to uh, to spend uh, the budget development budget in line with the SDGs projects. This is very important, like green, and then of course, if uh, this uh, development where we, but this SDG agenda is not of one developing country, it is the global agenda. This is one country is losing, then of course we are 193, we all are losing. If a country defaults, say for example, any country in Africa defaults from the debt, then it doesn't mean that the only country is defaulting, the whole system is collapsing because the, even the, 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 those who have given the loans, they are not getting anything from that. So, of course, this whole system needs to be more sustainable. So, uh, I, I finally um, want to uh, conclude what my remarks are at this stage, that there should be some focus on the international uh, uh, development finance as well in the final recommendations that what uh, kind of things and policy recommendations can you make uh, for, for some kind of like more uh, mobilizing the resources from the international resources. I, I understand yesterday, even uh, my ambassador mentioned about some immediate measures. Uh, there is a call for the meritorium to be continued on the debt relief, uh, on the debt relief extended by the developed countries in G20. They, this crisis is still not over. And of course, uh, then there are reforms going on on the international taxation system. Of course, the internal taxation, domestic resource mobilization is very important. Countries are doing their best to do it. But of course, on the other side, in international horizon, we see the digital companies, and then uh, there are several big uh, giants 
who are not paying tax to the developing countries and they are earning resources from their jurisdictions. So this is a big avenue from where the, the resources can come for the developing countries. So they should be given rights to tax these companies as per their jurisdictions. So if they are earning revenues from these countries, they should earn, um, uh, they should pay taxes to them. And of course, then there are certain other things uh, which are uh, being talked uh, about in the international organizations, uh, including uh, the expansion of the scope of the debt uh, and concessional loan, uh, like uh, uh, like common framework and other, other things, like they are not extendable to the middle income countries like Pakistan, because Pakistan is a middle income country. It does not qualify to uh, get access to the eligibility, uh, get access to these concessional loans. So there is where we, we face the handicaps. So here the role of UNCTAD and this institutions like UNESCAP has to come up and to make the wise because the criteria alone based on the GDP or GNI cannot serve the purpose. The, 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 the enormity of challenge is affecting equally the LDCs, M MICs, and then of course all the uh, developing countries in, in total. And then finally, lastly, uh, the, the, the long-standing work of this uh, debt reforms and then uh, international uh, financial architecture and then uh, a legal framework towards this debt restructuring is yet to be started or yet to be actualized because we see uh, still the developing countries does not have the voice in the decision-making boards of the different organizations, standard setting bodies. So where this is uh, also very important and there are countries which have the SDR allocations and then of course we are not able to utilize them because they are already developed and they have the they they are they have enough resources uh, all this having said uh, finally concluding my point that very good work by the uncut and excellent contributions by the by the nescap um, uh, in collaboration with pakistan's uh, institutions uh, we we look forward to the capacity building workshop uh, which is planned to be um, held in the august it is um, it is very good uh, but on the other side uh, my finally uh, Point is there should be some focus on the international uh, uh, financial resources as well, how to mobilize them for, for uh, the developing countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, these uh, points are very well taken. I, I think ESCAP has been talking about um, these issues on UNTAD as well. I mean, through this project where um, I, I will let my colleague uh, Sajid um, explain more about the Pakistan case, but um, on the regional side, we've been um, highlighting uh, quite a few of the issues that you've also mentioned, where um, we're asking for greater um, sort of Asia Pacific cooperation and having a united voice where uh, one asks for like, um, for uh, for debt relief, debt, uh, debt restructuring. I mean, given uh, the debt problems of this year, which is a very unique situation, where um, not in a, a position to really handle their debt uh, challenges um, at the moment. And um, so, uh, what what we do recommend is um, is a sort of um, is a new way of looking at uh, multilateral debt negotiations. Right? That's what we've been. Um, asking for from the SCAP side, which is um, considering the new debt challenges of countries as well as um, uh, the new debt, uh, debt frameworks. For example, the fact that um, bilateral de uh, debt has become a very important factor as well. So uh, again, for example, China, uh, that one has to include the bilateral partners in the debt renegotiations as, as well as the private creditors. Uh, multi, uh, uh, banks, for example, uh, other than the multilateral inter, uh, institutions. So um, what we argue for at, at the UN, uh, I mean, through the Secretary General, and we at um, ESCAP, we're supporting sort of regional countries to, to unite in um, using our forums in the ESCAP forums to, um, uh, to have a united voice uh, on these issues. Um, uh, let me uh, turn it over to Sajid, uh, my, my colleague, for some of the more particular um, reflections on Pakistan. Uh, thank you, Shobhajit. Uh, more or less, you have covered uh, many good things that has to be covered. Uh, but let me just give one announcement on behalf of Ali Kamal just received. Uh, unfortunately, he has been called by US Embassy for some meetings and he wasn't able to make this. Uh, but he has given his refresh commitment 
uh, to use this evidence and the work produced on this model to use as a uh, tool, major tool at the federal SDGs unit of uh, Planning Commission of uh, Pakistan. So that was on behalf of Ali Kamal. Uh, I think very uh, important intervention uh, from Rizwan Saab. Uh, two very important points that, and I have been highlighting uh, uh, Penelope also in last session when we were there, uh, that to me, this is the beginning of the work actually, uh, when it, it it may be the closing of the research work or the kind of producing evidence, uh, but this is the beginning of the uptake of that evidence. And I, I, I really agree on this one that uh, uptaking this work will be uh, really challenging and important, but I think we have some encouraging uh, signs coming as I, as I highlighted already in my, uh, in terms of global finance, uh, we have highlighted within this uh, paper, uh, but given the very limited time, I wasn't able to cover all the uh, nitty gritty for every recommendation, uh, but really uh, good to know uh, the kind of realization on the global finance. And one of the very recent work that SDPI is planning to do, and we, we are already starting debate on is, uh, that is the debt swaps, debt for nature swaps uh, in terms of debt reliefs and other uh, possible venues. We we, love, we would like to expand on, of course, in partnership with UNESCAP, UNCTAD, and the support from the government of uh, Pakistan, but we have already started a discussion and debate on, on, on this one. Uh, in terms of domestic green financing, we have been very closely working with State Bank of Pakistan uh, for its green financing initiative. And also we have had a couple of meetings uh, with the Pakistan Stock Exchange uh, to establish a green corner uh, where green financing is promoted, green shares are promoted to strengthen. Uh, and finally, I think we, we need some still good work uh, to kind of a capacity building of social bonds and the green bonds uh, in the financial market of uh, Pakistan. But overall, uh, these all issues are in our radar and we, we have already, for example, our upcoming paper is on what are the key challenges that Pakistan faces in terms of uh, climate financing, uh, particularly tapping the global clim climate funding for the finance. We have not been able to sort of, uh, it, it was roughly uh, 40 billion a dollar we need around a year. We were able to just receive one to $2 billion uh, over, over the last years. So we, we are working on, but I think uh, it, if, if it comes from uh, the forums like UNCTAD from like UNESCAP, of course, I think this can help us better uh, build on it. Uh, but we are really, as Shobhajit said, that we have been in conversations and we are thinking to work uh, on this one. Thank you. Back to you, Shobhajit. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we have another speaker. Uh, um, is uh, Keith Lockwood, um, who's who's been helping uh, UNCTAD with the sustainable development finance assessments, and I think he's talking again on our region on um, on Sri Lanka and uh, Indonesia. So um, should I uh, turn it over to Keith? Yes. Uh, thank you. Good morning right. to everyone. Um, or morning from my side of the world, anyway. Um, it's good to be with you. Yes, yeah, so I, I thought I would uh, focus specifically on um, the Sri Lankan case uh, for this quick uh, presentation. I um, was asked to do an application of the SDFA to Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Um, and then subsequently, I was asked to develop a, a um, effectively a, 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 a model where we could test different policy applications um, to see what uh, choices could be made and what particular um, changes would be particularly sensitive to um, either making a country's financial situation more or less sustainable. So I'm going to start off with a quick presentation that captures some of the key historical elements of the Sri Lankan case, and then I will um, um, Put up the the um, effectively the the dashboard, um, so we can il illustrate some of the um, policy choices and 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 how the model responds to those. All 
All right, so hopefully you can all see this. Uh, we'll skip past the first couple of slides. So in essence, the, the SDFA has these three components. The first uh, looks at the external financial sustainability. And in Sri Lanka's case, you'll see this is the, the Achilles heel of the system uh, for a large part. And then um, uh, it, it moves on to the public sector financial sustainability. And then the third component is an integrated sustainability, which takes the uh, external constraint and effectively applies it to the public sector financial uh, situation. All right, so in Sri Lanka's case, uh, one of the key issues, and, and this relates both to the sort of historic uh, and theoretical underpinnings of, of uh, the SDFA, but ultimately, if you want to change your external constraint, it really comes down to changing the respective propensities to import and export. And you can see in Sri Lanka's case, they were quite successful in significantly reducing their import propensity um, from around 41% in 2005, it got down to 27% uh, and then sort of stabilized around 28% mark in the, the mid 2010s. Um, you can see in, re in response to COVID, um, there was this uh, somewhat artificial and, and significant decline down to 23%. Um, but more importantly, prior to COVID, uh, the indication was that the, the import propensity was actually starting to trend upwards again. And then if we look at the export propensity, you can see a, a fairly similar pattern. It was trending higher. And in fact, uh, Sri Lanka performed quite well in relation to its export performance. Um, but again, in uh, the COVID times, it dropped quite dramatically. In terms of its current account, you can see it uh, had uh, consistent deficits through from 2005 onwards. The scale of the deficits changed or varied quite dramatically. Um, and in fact, in 2020, it narrowed. But again, that was largely a, a somewhat artificial response to to the COVID pandemic and the, and the significant reduction in imports. On the goods, on, when you look at a breakdown of the, the current account, you see some interesting trends. So the, the goods and services account are perpetually in deficit. The primary income account also in deficit um, and that deficit was generally growing. And then the secondary income account uh, generally in surplus, although that sort of leveled off um, at around 6 billion US dollars. Um, and the secondary income account is, is quite important from the perspective of the SDFA because it essentially is capturing personal transfers or remittances. Um, and uh, those have certainly been significant uh, in Sri Lanka's case. Um, they've had a, a very significant net immigration from the country and that has also then contributed to um, um, to a lot of remittances coming back to the country. But you can see that that is as sort of leveled off and there's question marks as to whether um, it could continually serve as a significant source of foreign exchange. Um, so a key element of the external constraint is really the ratio of net external liabilities to exports plus remittances or what the model refers to as augmented exports. Um, so you see that that uh, ratio, uh, or generally the net ex external liabilities increased at a much faster rate than the exports plus remittances on the left-hand graph. And so on the right-hand graph, when you express the one as a ratio of the other, you see these periods where um, that ratio was increasing, um, and then it sort of stabilized at around 1.8 a mark, and then in recent years, it really increased quite dramatically. And we would associate those periods of increase with deteriorating external financial sustainability. If we shift to the public sector uh, situation, um, I think it is important to note that the, the um, model itself would ideally want to use uh, public debt and the public sector debt, and it should actually refer to public sector net liabilities. So it's um, su uh, supposed to uh, deduct 
uh, financial assets from uh, that level of debt. But uh, we do have data constraints that uh, didn't make that possible in our analysis of um, Sri Lanka's case. But you see, you do see the, the fiscal balance um, deteriorating steadily over time, um, hitting in excess of 10% at the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, Sri Lanka does have a fiscal rule that says that the deficit shouldn't be more than 5%, but throughout the period in which that rule has been in place, they've actually never complied. Um, they also have additional fiscal rules that relate to the debt situation. That has changed over time, but currently it limits uh, government debt to 80% of GDP, and they are supposed to bring that back down to 60% by 2030. Um, and then there's a third one around contingent liabilities. So you see as a percent of GDP, the central government debt has certainly risen uh, dramatically and it broke the 100% mark. There is a little bit of data around public sector debt, although this is still in gross terms, and you see there's a, it's about 9% of GDP higher over that period. And then if you look at some of the underlying uh, fiscal dynamics, you see that expenditure, when you strip away interest costs, actually has increased pretty much in line with revenue. Um, but the interest costs themselves have really skyrocketed. So you've had a 650% increase in interest costs since 2005, compared with a 360% increase in revenue. And you can see what challenge that places uh, in terms of fiscal policy and the delivery of public services, because the interest cost as a percent of government revenue uh, in the right hand graph has increased dramatically from around 35%. And at the height of the COVID pandemic, when revenue uh, collapsed anyway, um, it exceeded 70%. So that doesn't leave government with much uh, scope for, for spending. In terms of the integrated model, uh, just to highlight a key element here. So we have a, a rate of growth in the economy that is consistent with external sustainability. Uh, that's referred to as GBP. And then there is an average cost of public sector liabilities, um, which we refer to as, as the real beta value. And if the rate of growth that sustainable is higher than the average cost of public sector liabilities, then that would generally be consistent with improving financial sustainability. When the reverse is true, you actually see a deterioration in, in um, uh, public sector financial sustainability. And so one of uh, Sri Lanka's problems is that the, um, uh, particularly since 2015 onwards, you've seen this uh, situation where the, 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 the cost of real public sector liabilities has been higher than the sustainable growth rate. Okay, so that's a little bit of the case study um, uh, element. So what I want to do now is just quickly highlight the, um, the dashboard. So uh, this is quite a busy thing. It's trying to capture a lot of information, but in essence, we've got um, the three elements of of uh, the SDFA, so the external constraint, the public sector constraint, and the integrated constraint. Um, we've got essentially a historical trend analysis. So we've got uh, the averages over, in this case, from 2010 to 2020 uh, and 2021. And then we've got a baseline scenario, which is forward looking, but it assumes that the same rates of or average um, performance that was applicable during the historic period will continue into the future. That is um, highlighted in the sort of pink uh, blocks. Um, both of those are essentially set, so they're a function of historic data. And then the third element is an alternative scenario where we can choose to change particular key variables of the model and see what impact that would have on sustainability. Um, so then in the center, there's a, a graph showing the external constraint and the area of financial sustainability. And you can see the gray uh, uh, dots are effectively the historical period, 
for the entire period, they were effectively operating outside the area of fiscal or financial sustainability. In essence, that meant uh, Sri Lanka was importing uh, more than it um, should have. And uh, as a consequence, its net external liabilities were increasing uh, at, a, at a faster rate than the ability to pay or, or, or repay those, those liabilities. And then you see the pink uh, dots going up to uh, 2031. That reflects the, um, the situation if we just continued with the same kind of averages and average performance as we'd seen in history. And then the blue dots are um, uh, the alternative scenario. And then the right-hand graph is showing the integrated constraint. Now the integrated constraint and the public sector constraint are essentially the same, except when you introduce the integrated constraint, the, the boundary condition and the area of uh, financial sustainability changes. Um, so the gradient of the boundary line uh, changes and that affects the area of integrated financial sustainability. So just to illustrate some of these points, uh, one of the key issues here if for, for Sri Lanka would be that it has quite a high import propensity. So if we were to adopt policies that would, would be able to bring down that propensity to import, let's say we take it down, I'm going to make it fairly extreme just to, to highlight the sensitivities. So let's say we take it down to 22%. Then you see that the pathway to um, uh, uh, external financial sustainability is established. And by 2024, um, Sri Lanka would tend to move into um, an area of, of external financial sustainability. If we were to increase the export propensity to let's say 25%, then you see that that actually serves to, to increase the area of external financial sustainability and we get even more or, or deeper into uh, an area of um, uh, that, is that, that is financially sustainable. Now, I mentioned that Sri Lanka has got a, a quite a high reliance on personal transfers or remittance income. Um, so if we were to increase the, the rate of growth in that remittance income, um, to let's say 10%, then you will see that once again, the, the area that's externally sustainable increases. Um, but in the right-hand graph, you would also have noted that the, the rate of growth that's, that's sustainable um, uh, from an external perspective also increases, and that ultimately uh, increases the gradient for public sector finances as well. Okay, a key element of the, the, um, uh, the constraint is around the cost of your external liabilities. So if you were able to bring down that cost from the historical average of say 7.3%, and let's say we took that down to 3%, then again, you see that the area that is financially sustainable improves and increases, and it just gives a lot more policy scope to pursue different agendas and, and policy initiatives. So if we move on to the public sector um, spending, um, one of the elements, if you reduced the growth in regular public spending, um, let's just say to 6% a year. Um, and then if we were to create scope for additional spending around anything from SDGs to pursuing the, the global climate change agenda, whatever it might be. So in, in relation to SDGs, um, for the SDG one to fours, it was estimated um, that Sri Lanka would need to invest an additional four and a half percent roughly of GDP um, in order to achieve those, those SDG. So if we were to increase that spending, then you'll see there's an impact on imports because um, a certain proportion of, of that um, of those imports is, is um, showing. But in the right-hand graph, um, there's a particular impact on the public sector financial conditions. A key, another key aspect of Sri Lanka's situation is that they allowed their, their revenue as a percent of GDP to drop. They adopted particular tax changes in 2019 that saw a drop. So if they were 
able to bring up or to raise their, their revenue as a share of GDP, then you see that that starts to bring back their, um, their, their, their prospective position and their debt to GDP ratio. Um, Sri Lanka, in this instance, we've got the 80% of GDP as a fiscal rule and the 5% deficit rule in place. Um, interestingly, Sri Lanka historically was able to borrow money, the public sector borrowed money in, uh, in net negative terms, so minus 1.6% a year averaged over that period. But compared to what we see in um, OECD countries, for example, uh, um, I saw that about 70% of fixed interest bonds were issued at 1% or less. And with current inflation rates, you could probably say that they are effectively borrowing money at, at sort of negative five or 6% currently. Um, so if we were to take that down, uh, you would see quite a uh, material change again in, in the sustainability um, position. Okay, I, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. I hope um, that uh, you found it interesting and um, I'm happy to take questions if, they, if there's time for them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very illuminating um, uh, presentation. Uh, obviously, I mean, Sri Lanka, is uh, I, it's, it's very much in the, all our concerns at the, at the moment. So yeah, I mean, uh, so it's, it's, it's especially uh, important your analysis now. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other questions because we, we have run over time. So um, I'm not sure if there aren't, maybe I pass it back to Penelope, but yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I see uh, Sajid has a question. Um, we we are slightly over time, but we do have a break. So go ahead, Sajid. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I knew, I mean, I was told that Anktad is in, in sort of connection with the government of Pakistan on, on sort of SDFA, SDFA. So I just have one quick question on, on this one that, for example, uh, when we are uh, sort of simulating the impact of increasing remittances on sustainability, uh, does the model control, uh, how is that growth in remittances coming? For example, uh, one way will be that if there is a sort of, you know, remittances are counter cyclical. Uh, and if there is a very serious economic meltdown, uh, remittances may increase, uh, particularly if they are household or home consumption as Pakistan see this recent rise. So does the model handle this one? What is the source of that growth? Does it differentiate the impact? Thank you. Yeah, so in the context of Sri Lanka, certainly the, uh, as I indicated, one of the dynamics that have driven the growth in remittances and that have made it a very important part of um, foreign exchange earnings has been this net emigration. So uh, it's one of the few countries in the world where they actually project that by 2050, its population will be significantly lower than uh, is currently the case. And that's partly because um, there's this expectation that remittance, tra uh, sorry, um, immigration trends would continue. Um, but when you look at the underlying um, uh, growth in in that in those remittances, you don't. Well, you first of all see that they've leveled off in effect. Um, and so, I'm not sure uh, we didn't specifically delve into the underlying dynamics around that. Um, so, I'm not sure to what extent you could make the argument for for counter cyclicality here. Um, if you look at those trends, I'm not sure that they are they are uh, evident or, or providing evidence of counter cyclicality. Um, but I guess you have to also under, understand the dynamics of of immigration. So when people um, move out of a country and they establish themselves in other countries, they might eventually uh, there be pressure on them to send um, remittances back home. Um, but at some point they might uh, start to reduce the, the extent of those remittances as they try to struggle and, and establish themselves in their new, in their new locations. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that I could say much more at that uh, around this time, thanks.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, to, to Shubhajit, to Sajid and Keith for um, stepping in. And thank you also for um, the comments from um, Rizwan. It's excellent to see that we can have some uh, engagement and discussion in these sessions. We have been slightly short of that. Um, of course, there has been the time constraint, but um, thank you for an excellent session. Um, our next session will be focusing on um, Africa. Um, Hope Stone is here, I see already in the room, and he will chair that session. So welcome to all of those who've arrived. Um, we have a, a, just six minutes for a break. We will start again at 11.15, um, and we are on time. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you then. Before you go, may I just remind you that part of what we are doing in these meetings is to also get feedback from you as participants. And as you exit, you may encounter a survey. Um, I say may because um, it appears that it doesn't work for everyone. I think it depends on how you exit Zoom. So um, what I would just like to warn you is that if we have not received a survey from you, um, if you could please just be um, kind and responsive when you receive an email from us, um, because we will ask you after the series of meetings uh, to give us some feedback. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to meeting again at 11.15. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, I see our speakers have arrived for the next session. Um, I am very excited to have this kind of continuation of the discussion that we started earlier this morning with our Asian um, Pacific uh, connection and including, of course, uh, several Asian countries. Um, now we move to a panel discussion on domestic revenue mobilization for sustainable development in Africa. Um, yesterday, Hopestone gave us a very useful um, introduction as to how the, this emphasis on domestic revenue mobilization came about. Um, and I'm hoping that he is here. Um, Hopestone, are you with us? Yes, Penelope, good morning. I'm, I'm right here, thank you. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, Hopestone, shall I hand over to you to moderate the session? Uh, thank you, thank you, colleagues, and uh, good morning uh, from uh, this side of the world. Uh, this session actually will be composed of uh, uh, three brief presentations. I have with me colleagues, uh, Professor Wawile, uh, then uh, Mr. Nalishevo, uh, who are going to uh, give a country case uh, studies and findings of our study. As I indicated yesterday, uh, this particular exercise uh, was undertaken looking at the challenges that African countries are facing as uh, they, 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 they chat their ways out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated effects. And uh, one of uh, the issues that came out is the, the dwindling uh, uh, revenues being collected in uh, these particular countries for their development needs. And we wanted to look at uh, uh, quick ways as to how African countries uh, could raise part of their revenues uh, in the in the prevailing situation. So, uh, in short, I will give a brief presentation uh, on uh, what the first phase of the project did, is which was to develop a framework. Uh, that framework is the one that has been applied to three countries: Ethiopia, uh, Zambia, and Kenya. And uh, today we are going after I present the the framework. Uh, I'll ask my two colleagues to make presentations on uh, those specific country uh, case studies. Um, I'm not sure if I have the rights to share my presentation here. Uh, okay, it's here now. We did see it for a second there, Hopestone. Uh, come again. I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out where my presentation is. Um, my goodness. Yes, it's confusing if there are too many things open. Um, yeah, that is that is what I'm that's what I'm facing now. Let me close some of these things. Um, my apologies for that. That's fine. We can we can wait. Okay, let's see where am I?
I hope you can see my presentation now. We absolutely can. Thank you so much, Herbstein. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot. As, as I indicated uh, uh, yesterday, uh, because of the shrinking space that was observed on the uh, uh, African continent, even before the COVID-19, uh, there was an urgent need to look at ways and means as to how uh, we could uh, uh, help African countries to actually uh, help in, in enhancing their fiscal space. And the domestic resource mobilization was actually considered as a, one of uh, the most important sources and the faster way of, of doing that. Uh, during that period, actually, we kept on receiving requests from different countries uh, uh, to, to, to provide support in that area. And one of the countries was Ethiopia, where we actually, by after looking at the, the uh, country taxation regime, we uh, analyzed and observed that uh, their excise tax regime could be the easiest way of uh, uh, enhancing tax collection. Uh, revenues in that particular regard. And uh, we initiated uh, an exercise that uh, looked at uh, the, uh, the country's uh, excise regime, uh, which also with the recommendations that came out of that exercise led to the uh, reforms that uh, are taking place even now uh, in terms of uh, the country's taxation system. And uh, in, during that period, over the period 2020, 2021, uh, the country experienced actually a significant increase in tax revenues. Uh, this uh, exercise led to uh, an extended request where, the, where they indicated that instead of looking at the excise tax, we should also look at the, the direct tax system that the company, the country has put in place. Uh, during that time also, that's the time this project actually came in and we thought it wise that uh, this project should look at that direct tax regime uh, in countries uh, of uh, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya and Zambia. And uh, with the, the main objective of uh, uh, the, 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 the project being to assess the African country's direct tax policies with the view of strengthening domestic resource mobilization as they transition out and through the COVID-19 period. And specifically, uh, this first phase of the project was to develop a, a framework uh, that would guide in that particular process, uh, actually looking at uh, the country's tax regimes and identifying methodologies that actually could be used in a, this particular assessment and also provide alternative options uh, in terms of uh, policies that could help in a maximizing a revenue collection in the different countries. Uh, the exercise uh, to come up with the framework, it involved uh, carrying out uh, some situational analysis, looking at the African continent, the landscape of our uh, uh, fiscal uh, management policies, as well as the, the tax regimes that we have on the continent. Uh, basically, during that time, uh, it was observed that uh, countries took deliberate steps at fiscal consideration, consolidation, uh, mainly aimed at uh, rebuilding their fiscal spaces. And uh, the contraction of activities was also expected during that time because this was the time COVID had uh, just uh, started. Uh, was expected to reduce Africa's domestic uh, tax revenues. And also it was uh, projected that uh, the negative effect on, uh, on uh, revenue mobilization were also projected to, to, to decline. Uh, the overall fiscal expenditures also uh, were projected to increase. That's uh, what we got from that analysis. And uh, the expansionary policies, which were aimed at, uh, at, uh, at uh, 
at combating the COVID-19 crisis meant that the country had to adjust tax policies uh, to minimize the, the effects of the pandemic on uh, the country's lives and livelihoods. And uh, it was also observed that uh, uh, debt sustainability remained a key uh, focus area, uh, hence having uh, adverse uh, uh, implications for macroeconomic stability and growth in the different countries. Uh, this, in essence, uh, meant that uh, we need to embark on, a, on a domestic resource mobilization to increase capacity and the development spending uh, in order to achieve fiscal sustainability in the different countries, especially the ones that uh, uh, we selected to come up with this particular exercise. Uh, through the process of analysis and the literature review, we identified the uh, mostly common challenges and opportunities that existed in different countries. Uh, let me say that uh, during the, 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 the development of this particular framework, the focus was not only on the three countries, but uh, most of the big economies on the continent. And here I'm just presenting some of the common uh, challenges that uh, were actually observed in the selected countries that we had in the study. Uh, lack of capacity to negotiate contracts, especially when it, it comes to natural resource extraction in the different African countries, which has significantly led to a loss of revenues in these countries. Uh, also, they rely on a narrow set of taxes and ineffective uh, tax administration processes are uh, also uh, are were identified. Uh, also those arising from the digitalization of the African economies where taxing the sale and the procurement of goods and services uh, through digital means still remains in infancy stage and a challenge to most countries when it comes to tax collection. Uh, high levels of exemptions and deductions that tend to narrow the tax base and abuse of tax incentives was also uh, observed one of the issues that affect the direct tax systems on the continent. Then in terms of opportunities, they, they are opportunities to broaden the, 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 the tax base and elimination of exemptions and tax holidays, uh, improvement in a, a taxation of capital income, and uh, dealing with uh, transfer pricing abuses by uh, multilateral enterprises and the uh, taxing extractive industries fairly and transparently was looked at as uh, being one of the opportunity that countries could use. The granting of tax incentives to sectors such as technology, especially those that have got the positive externalities for the different economies uh, was also identified another opportunity and uh, develop, developing capacity for tax expenditures and wider policy analysis to keep track of uh, revenue that is, is foregone. Um, these tax expenditures also are looked at as uh, one of uh, the areas that African countries could tap on. Um, Based broadening policies, such as the restrictions to a loss uh, carryover provisions that is uh, common in most countries, and the use of uh, digital technologies, especially when it comes to tax administration, uh, would also uh, literature indicated that uh, that could also be one of the main areas uh, that would be of importance. Uh, the review of tax treaties and the aim for more taxing rights. Uh, most of the countries were also uh, 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 reviewed and indicated uh, some opportunities uh, existing from that particular angle. Uh, this actually, this analysis and review of uh, the different areas in terms of direct tax regimes on the continent led to the, uh, the preparation and the design of the framework, which is aimed at the, to guide the, the preparations of uh, technical assessments uh, of uh, gaps in domestic resource mobilization in, in different countries on the continent. Also, the, the, the framework uh, discusses the analytical tools and techniques uh, that could be applied to analyze tax structures with the objective of establishing these particular gaps 
uh, in both tax administration and policy to promote revenue mobilization. And uh, one of uh, the, the areas in terms of review that the, uh, the framework talks about is uh, looking at uh, the tax regime features of uh, different countries, especially in terms of corporate income tax and personal income tax uh, with the different components that are indicated there as well as uh, indicating why they are very significant in terms of uh, tax regime reviews uh, to identify opportunities and, and challenges. Uh, then also there's uh, the issue, you know, most African countries are resource rich and uh, one of, uh, uh, and being one of the areas that uh, countries could tap on in terms of taxation uh the uh the instrument actually the framework also talks about the uh the natural resource tax uh these are actually looking at the tax instruments that it could apply could be applied on a resource rent generated from the exploitation of minerals oil as well as gas and also the issue of royalties uh that uh, comes with this particular industry that most of the countries could actually look at and, and enhance their revenue uh, mobilization uh, services. And uh, also it indicates uh, the different uh, types of areas uh, that uh, could be looked at in terms of uh, assessing the, the, the tax regime that governs the uh, natural resource endowments in each and every country. You look at the royalty regime, also, you look at the corporate and income tax uh, related to uh, to this particular sector. This all this actually uh, involves is expected to involve a significant and critical review of uh, the country's tax laws and the mining codes, as well as the, the regulations and the circulars that the government issue time after time in this particular area. And also the, the framework, yeah, as I indicated earlier on, it also covers a number of analytical tools and techniques that uh, could be used uh, in, in actually identifying these particular opportunities, uh, as well as challenges that the country uh, uh, might be going through, the assessment of the gaps in the domestic resource mobilization, which would actually involve the estimation of taxable capacity and tax effort, tax gap analysis and revenue forecasting, a direct tax revenue performance analysis, diagnostic frameworks for tax expenditures, just as some of the areas that the framework touches on, as well as why they are important tools to guide in this particular process. And in, in the end, it actually outlines some of the potential outcomes from the analysis uh, and uh, why they are important, uh, basically, which would uh, help in uh, building the capacity and provide support for the implementation of the development of the frameworks and recommendations for appropriate responses and recovery for development. Uh, it will also help in uh, developing a comprehensive and focused national tax policy strategy that could provide stability and transparency, uh, enable also countries to remove some more redundant uh, tax incentives and build capacity in Africa uh, as they undertake the tax gap analysis, uh, enhance the effectiveness of tax administration through simplification of tax system, uh, the procedures for paying taxes, as well as tax reforms uh, to ensure that uh, taxpayers receive help are from government agencies as well. So these are what uh, the potential outcomes that uh, the framework was expected to achieve when you when you try to do the critical analysis uh, using uh, the tool itself. So as I indicated, this tool not just limited because the different countries have got different uh, tax regimes and the operating environments. Uh, the colleagues that are going to present actually made some modifications 
added some components in their analysis depending on the, on the country, not just limited to what the framework says, uh, taking into consideration the, the diversity of African economies. Uh, this uh, marks the end of my short presentation. Um, at this moment, I'll ask uh, uh, Professor Wawide, I hope, Prof, you can hear me to give us uh, an overview of uh, the study and the, the associated findings in Kenya. Prof, are you there? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. Thank you very much much and the floor is yours thank you uh, i think you can pull down your presentation so now, that i'm able to to put share my... you is it not yet down not not at my not end yet. um you need to unshare ah yeah. oh, there you go you've done it well done okay yes thank you Thank you, Prof. We can see your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nelson Owire. I was doing, uh, I was trying to assess uh, direct tax revenue mobilization in Kenya. In the program is written as Zambia, but uh, I'm the one who was assessing uh, revenue mobilization in Kenya. Uh, the Kenyan economy. Uh, prof, has had, prof, yes, excuse, yes. Ex, excuse me, Prof. Could you make it full screen? Your presentation. Could you make it full screen, please? Actually, on my end is full screen. Um, I think if you just click the bar where it says slideshow, uh, then it will actually present as a. Uh, then we won't see the, the stuff around the margin and so on. So at the top, at the top, there is a option to click on slideshow. No, right, right on the on the menu there, file yeah, I've, search I've... design. I have actually clicked, uh, clicked the slideshow. Mm -hmm. On my end, is showing very well. Okay, uh, well, don't, don't worry then, about that. Okay. We will just go on. Thank you. Okay. Then go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, the Kenyan economy has experienced uh, economic growth that is slightly higher than the average for the sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, according to uh, Bias, I think uh, is doing much better. Uh, in terms of the average tax to GDP ratio, this has remained almost stable at about 15.2% of GDP. That is the total tax that is collected. And uh, tax reforms have taken place over time but uh, they have not enhanced the buoyancy of the tax system. So we are not collecting as much as we expected. Uh, we expected to collect. There has been a lot of uh, expansion of infrastructure in terms of spending on infrastructure. And most of this infrastructure expenditure has been funded by borrowing. Uh, especially uh, external borrowing, given the low tax mobilization in the country. Um, there has been low revenue growth. This low revenue growth has threatened debt sustainability. In fact, our debt is now about 8 uh, trillion, very, very, very high. Um, the seal is just about uh, 9 trillion. Although uh, there is a, uh, some effort going on to improve the, the to increase the ceiling, uh, in terms of implementation of uh, SDGs, uh, Prof, Prof, I wonder if you could just move us down to slide three. 
so we can see we can currently only see the uh, the front slide, the top slide. Can you maybe move us down to the next slide? I'm still on slide two. Okay, we, we can still only see slide one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just maybe uh, you, let me just stop. You stop sharing and reshare again. Maybe that would help. Yeah. And maybe just increase the size. Uh, are you seeing that one? Yes, seeing that one, but these slides are not moving. Try to make it full screen now. I think it could work now. You've got an option there that says resume slideshow that I can see. I wonder if you could yeah. use that. That might work. It, Prof, are you seeing something on your screen saying resume slideshow? There's an icon there. This is uh, it's a bit puzzling. Slideshow. This yeah. is slideshow. Okay, fine. That's great. So if you can just move us on as you go, it, it's quite readable now. It's a nice size. Thank you. Okay, so we uh, I was explaining the background and the slide that should be there should be the background. Is that okay? Perfect. Yes, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So I was saying that uh, there's a challenge in terms of implementation of sustainable development goals because of the revenues that we are raising um, are quite low. And uh, debt is currently estimated at 67.5% of GDP and about 20% of the revenue is used to pay interest. So interest payment takes most of the, 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 the money and uh, this situation therefore calls for very important uh, policy uh, implication in terms of, uh, of tax. In terms of taxable capacity and tax effort, uh, there's a table there. I hope you are seeing the table. Um, looking at the uh, real GDP per capita growth, I had an average of 2000 to 2002. And then I was comparing with the 2017-2019 average and 2018-2020 with an effort to try and see what happened during COVID-19. And you can see uh, the real GDP <coughs> uh, growth uh, increased up to this average of 2017-2019 to 2.4. And fortunately with the coming of COVID, uh, it reduced to 1.1, uh, although it was still positive. Uh, uh, I want, sorry, I wonder if you can just press page down for us because we, we can't see the table. We can still see the background slide. Can I do without, uh, uh, because uh, slides are, sh are moving on my side. Ah, huh? uh, okay. Uh, but it looks like in your side, they are not moving. So it's fine, then maybe just talk. Uh, 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 let, let me stop uh, sharing and uh, do something I did some other time. When there was that issue. I want to move without a slideshow. That's so this is the hat. background. Yes, this you is found the that. Table. Now we can see that. That's good. Yeah, this is the table. So, so on this table, you, you can see uh, comparing these three averages, 
you find that uh, actually most of these um, um, measures of taxable capacity have increased from 2000 to 2017, 2019. But uh, when COVID set in, most of them went down. You can see real GDP per capita. You can see real GDP growth, uh, uh, growth rate uh, reducing from 4.8 to 3.4. You can see uh, population here increased, of course, uh, uh, even during uh, COVID-19. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it was not affected. There was an increase, and that has uh, effect on um, government spending. And then you can see real trade openness captured by imports and exports. Uh, you can see there is there was an increase, but when COVID came in, it reduced to about from about uh, forty-eight four sixty-nine to forty-two uh, eight sixty-eight. And then all these shares, the share of agriculture, forestry and fishing in GDP, uh, <clears throat> this share here is an interesting um, indicator of capacity because what is happening is that uh, in 2000, um, it was 26.8, but that reduced by 2017, 2019 to 20.8 um, and remained 20, Point eight, And uh, as we shall be talking about this, you will discover that agriculture is one of, uh, most agricultural activities are subsistence. Uh, they are informal and very, very difficult to dress for taxing purposes. Probably that is what might have uh, caused this particular decline. Share of industry, we have also had uh, issues with uh, this share. It has almost remained constant, uh, although there was a slight decline from 2000 to 2007, 2017, 2018. And when COVID hit, it even went down. Uh, mining um, increased a bit. Uh, service sector actually the kenyan economy has been driven by service sector you can see as a percentage of gdp uh, it increased from 62.79 to 70.18 and uh, with the uh, still with COVID, it was doing quite well so the kenyan economy is actually driven by service sector and most uh, not really the productive uh, sectors as you have seen in terms of quality of bureaucratic and political institution, which is one of the indicators of taxable capacity, that remained constant. So the objective for this assignment was to carry out comprehensive uh, reviews of the existing income tax system in terms of both policy and legal issues, identify and enumerate key disincentive features, and uh, use the existing data to carry out empirical studies to support the policy conclusions and recommendations and give alternative options for policy adoption meant to maximize revenues. Um, in terms of uh, methodology, uh, I used the, I utilized the UNECA uh, a theoretical framework, analytical framework, which uh, has just been presented by Hope Stone. Um, in terms of uh, the sources of information, um, I visited uh, and interviewed, had interviews and discussions with key informants in the National Treasury and Planning, Kenya Revenue Authority, Kenya National Gem of Commerce and Industry, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, Retirement Benefit. This word is Benefit Authority, Institute of Satisfied Public Accountants, and the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade, and Enterprise Development, and then the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining. So we had a discussion and these particular ministries. 
what came out of uh, this, uh, of course, uh, we ha had also to use the uh, published data uh, for various, uh, from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics and uh, where possible from IMF and the World Bank. And so the results, looking at the tax revenue, this table here is looking at the, let, let me just show it uh, full. This table here is looking at the tax revenue in relation to cross domestic product and in relation to direct tax revenue. So you find that uh, the tax revenue here uh, in 2000, average of 2000, 2002, the mean was just 15.5. Uh, 2017, 2019, the mean did not increase. It was still 15.3. And 2018, 2020, it reduced, um, which I'm uh, thinking that uh, it's because of the, the COVID. In terms of income tax revenue, which is the direct tax of interest in this uh, research, you can see the mean improved um, over the years slightly from five to around seven point something. Uh, in terms of the contribution of income tax to total tax revenue, you can see is uh, 36%, then it went to 47% and reduced slightly uh, when you include the 2020, which was the year for COVID-19. So the disincentive um, uh, that uh, I discovered from my study, we had uh, there is inadequate physical policy, low taxable capacity in the country. There are a lot of leakages and revenue collection, weak enforcement, and a large informal sector, which is hard to tax. And then there is the issue of tax expenditures. Um, these tax expenditures are angered in law. And uh, so when you look at the section 77 of public finance management, they are well stated. The only unfortunate thing is that we do not have a policy that guides the process of awarding them. In fact, the cabinet secretary has a lot of leeway uh, to decide um in terms of their uh, awarding and so th that is an issue so in terms of um, broad recommendation on these uh, issues um i'm saying that we can amend the act to make rules about exemptions firmly stated in laws and regulations and to publicly disclose information about exemptions. This is the cabinet secretary to publicly disclose information about exemptions that he has given. And then we establish an appropriate evidence-based tax expenditure governance framework to limit leakages and improve transparency uh, in income tax exemptions. These are broad uh, recommendations in that uh, given those uh, disincentives. In terms of uh, analysis of specific uh, direct taxes, that is personal income tax, as well as corporate income tax, um, you can see uh, this, this uh, figure here, uh, the trends in the figure. You can see Kenya, is collecting much more all along from 2002, is collecting more in terms of personal income tax compared to corporate income tax. The green one is corporate income tax. Let me just show the key, yes. Personal income tax you can see is always higher uh, than the corporate income tax as a share of GDP. And in fact, if you check closely, it is widening. The cap is widening. Um, 
And yet we know that the companies are formal. And so it's much easier to even collect taxes from companies compared to the personal income tax where people can evade very easily. They don't disclose much. And so they could be something that is happening with the corporate income tax that maybe needs some, uh, a lot of uh, reforms or uh, a lot of scrutiny as I will uh, uh, talk about it. Uh, Chair, um, the next table. Uh, Prof, can I just ask you if you yes, could please. try to aim to finish by midday so that we can also give a chance to the other speakers. So that's okay, about okay. three or four minutes for you. Okay, okay, that, that is fine. So this table is again just showing uh, the shares of uh, uh, personal income tax in GDP and in uh, total tax and uh, also the corporate income tax in uh, GDP and in uh, uh, tax revenue. Uh, and the story is just the same as the one in the FICA. Um, so as I said, the personal income has performed much better than the corporate income. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of possible reasons for this uh, poor performance, uh, as I indicated much earlier, the informality, uh, we have uh, tax literacy, low tax literacy levels, there are issues of cash transfer, which then uh, um, requires that uh, uh, most of the, 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 the transfers, actually the cash transfers, if they are done, it means that they can lead to leakages, inability to ensure compliance and all that. Uh, in terms of, uh, because of time, I want to go to some area on uh, tax expenditures, which uh, I, uh, the preferential tax uh, regimes, especially the ones located in export processing zones, uh, there are issues there in terms of corporate income tax rate, uh, which ranges from zero for some companies for the first 10 years, that is the tax holiday and 25% uh, for the following years. So there are issues to be uh, discussed in terms of uh, taxation of this, this area. Um, the other area is the tax revenue losses this ability to carry forward losses indefinitely or over a long period of time uh, needs to be, to be checked also. Um, so there is a, a proposal there. And then there's the issue of double taxation treaties also, um, which uh, uh, some existing, they, it puts strain on existing uh, rules, especially the third countries, countries that have not signed the double taxation treaties and they want to enjoy uh, those treaties. Then the issue of transfer pricing is also captured, especially um, national corporations. Tax incentives uh, is also an issue. Uh, at this incentive issue that needs to be looked at. I've uh, mentioned the tax holiday, uh, which are also issues. And then uh, these withholding taxes have also uh, to be looked at uh, because they give way to leakages of, of, of revenue. So like the capital gains taxes, uh, fortunately, when uh, I I finished this paper and uh, uh, you know submitted in the budget, the capital gains tax was actually increased because I was recommending increase from five to ten, but Kenya has increased from five to fifteen. 
Um, and uh, I was thinking that maybe it's part of the discussions we had with national treasury. So in a nutshell, uh, there are issues to do with the extractive industry and the informal sector that has to be addressed through policy. And so uh, tax policy uh, reforms in Kenya uh, need to, uh, we, we, we need to really look at the tax policy to address the issues of digitization of the economy, informal sector and extractive industries. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, time was quite limited, but the paper is with the uh, UNECA. Uh, if we want to look at it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for that presentation. Sorry about the time. Time is uh, uh, against that. Thanks for being with us throughout the process. I'll quickly ask Mr. Nalishebo if you are online to, to make your presentation, please stick to time. Uh, it's a maximum of 15 minutes. Mr. Nalishebo, if you are there, you are on mute. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Chavula. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, can you? Yes, we can see it in full. Okay, okay, all right, thanks. Uh, uh, due to the, uh, the 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 wealth of information that that we have in the report, and uh, looking at the time that is given for uh, this presentation, uh, basically just narrowed down to uh, personal income tax uh, uh, with regard to uh, this particular presentation. But the full report. Uh, like the Kenyan one uh, covers quite an area of, uh, of, of issues, including uh, corporate income tax, as well as uh, uh, what we call in Zambia mineral royalties. Uh, just as, as a way of uh, background, uh, Zambia is presently beset with uh, a number of fiscal and debt challenges, which require some adjustments to make an economic turnaround. And uh, uh, at the time when COVID was hitting, we were already actually on a, on a downward uh, trajectory. So we had uh, uh, challenges which included lower levels of economic growth, uh, limited growth in tax revenues, and already high and, and unsustainable debt. We, we're looking at, in the Zambian case, our debt to GDP ratio is uh, probably about double that of Kenya, around 120% of GDP. Uh, and we have in the next coming years, a number of loans which are falling due, uh, uh, including the, the famous Euro bonds, we're looking about $3 billion uh, uh, to pay back. And further with, uh, when COVID-19 uh, uh, hit, it put a lot of uh, fiscal pressures on the economy and we had an unprecedented fiscal deficit of 14.5% of GDP in, 20, uh, in 2010. And because we defaulted on our on several loans in 2020, we haven't had we had limited access to international markets. So for us, looking within to generate enough resources uh, is really uh, cardinal, and, and this project uh, could not have come at a better time. Uh, this slide just basically just uh, gives you a brief overview of uh, the Zambian tax system. Uh, uh, from 1995, 96 to 2019, we've averaged, uh, just like Kenya, about 15% of GDP, uh, which is lower than the SADC average of 21% of GDP. And uh, the medium term uh, target is to move it to 18% of GDP by 2024. If, if you look at uh, uh, the tax mix, the tax revenue mix, the main um, uh, uh, tax types is income taxes, value added tax and customs and excise duties. And we see that the income taxes are the most dominant tax type, averaging 45% of the total tax revenues during that period. So uh, looking at uh, uh, this particular uh, tax, uh, uh, the income taxes or analysis of, an, of income taxes is actually quite appropriate for us because that's where we got we get most of our revenues. 
Uh, we sort of took a slightly different approach uh, with regard to our understanding of the, um, of the analytical framework uh, by uh, narrowing down into uh, what I would call the back end of taxes, uh, looking at the tax design uh, features of what the income tax system is and what the tax base ought to be, as well as uh, comparing to the tax law, how well uh, the tax law is designed to capture the tax base. And then after looking at the tax law, then, uh, then we moved on to the tax administration, how the administration of the tax, uh, how it's actually administered. And then based on the gaps that we uh, uh, that, that we identified, we, we then uh, came up with some reform proposals. Uh, what we did with uh, regard to the uh, personal income tax is first, uh, 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 like I said, go to the back end, look at, um, uh, for personal income taxation, look at the family. Uh, uh, in this case, we have, we have a five member uh, household and then ask the questions, how will these how will this family be taxed? So we have um, we have the man who is employed in a permanent and pensionable um, uh, job. Uh, he has access to employer provided housing and medical cover. And then together with his wife, this is a middle class family. So together with his wife, they have joint investments in government securities with a five year bond, uh, particularly. And then they also have joint dividend income from an investment that they did uh, uh, in, in South Africa. And then when you look at uh, his wife, she's self-employed, runs a small business uh, selling fruits and vegetables at a nearby market and uh, with joint dividend and interest income uh, together with, uh, uh, with the husband. And then of course you have those um, school going children as well as an infant. So looking at this, uh, we ask our, our questions, what are the key considerations for taxing the, the persons in this family? First question we ask is what type of income can be gleaned from this household that should be subject to tax? And then we ask the question, do we tax uh, uh, this family as a family or separately for each individual? Uh, and then do we impose the taxes on each of the sources of income that were identified separately or should the, those uh, uh, should a single tax be imposed on all incomes regardless of its nature. Here we're looking at the global and scheduler basis of taxation. And then what are the sources of income and where are the taxpayers resident? Here we looked at the source and residence principles. And then after that, that's when we looked at how then is a taxable income determined? And if you have any exemptions that need to be excluded from the gross income, any deductions, allowances, and credits. And then after we come up with, an, with the taxable income, what tax schedule should be applied? And all these aspects are covered in the, in the UNECA analytical framework. So in terms of the first question about what type of income can be gleaned from this household, we basically came up with four uh, uh, types of income, which is employment income, uh, for the man, uh, he also has investment income from dividends and interest and then fringe benefits. Uh, the employer provided housing and medical cover. While, while for, the, for the wife, uh, she has an incorporated business income and then, uh, and then the investment income, which they, they have jointly. So then we ask the question, should taxes be imposed on each source of income separately or should it be imposed on all income regardless of its nature? If you look at the Zambian tax system, then we, we look at into the, to answer this question, we look into the tax law and we, we, we find that actually the Zambian tax system is, is global uh, uh, and which helps us to achieve vertical equity more easily as uh, since the tax is based on an aggregate measure of income. But just like many other countries, uh, it has a, a strong, uh, schedule of uh, features, which I'll explain a little later. Then, uh, should we tax uh, this income as a family or separately for each individual? Again, um, to answer that question, we look into the Income Tax Act, uh, uh, which, uh, by the way, the Income Tax Act in Zambia is both for personal and corporate income tax. We only have one single law. 
So when you look at the Income Tax Act, it, it, it guides us that uh, for, for the Zambian case, the, uh, it specifies that an individual is subject to tax. And the choice of a taxable uh, unit at the individual level, uh, it has important equity and, and, and efficiency implications. Uh, in terms of equity, we see that individual taxation seems neutral with regard to marital status. You don't, it avoids the inequalities in taxation between married and unmarried couples if you had to uh, uh, consider doing joint taxation. And then in terms of efficiency, it, it avoids uh, the efficiency problem uh, that results from joint taxation, trying to determine what a household is, uh, what the marital status is, and so on. Uh, so, so the Zambian uh, uh, tax authorities chose uh, to tax at individual level to avoid those problems. Then in terms of the source of income and where the taxpayers are resident, the, uh, when you look at the example that, that we gave, uh, all income is assumed to be from Zambian sources except for the dividend income which came from, which assumed came from uh, South Africa. And then we also assume that the taxpayers are resident. Uh, this is very important uh, to establish this for, for the purpose of taxation. So when you look into the Income Tax Act, uh, the section 14.1a specified that an individual, whether resident or non-resident is subject to, uh, to tax on income within or deemed to be from, uh, from within Zambia. So we, uh, the income tax is, is a territorial type of uh, tax and it also defines a resident who should pay tax and specifies the period, which is the 183 days uh, or more in a particular uh, charge year. However, there are exceptions for the person like this family where they have foreign sourced income received by the resident individuals, they are subject to tax on the interest and dividends that they receive. In this example that we have, uh, we had dividend income from uh, South Africa. And then of course, where there's a double taxation treaty uh, that applies, this, this will come into effect. And then uh, when we're trying to look at now, how is a taxable income determined? Again, we looked at in the Income Tax Act, uh, 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 it, it's, uh, the, the, the taxes are levied on net income. So it was gross income minus allowable tax reliefs. And Section 17 of the Income Tax Act and the Fair Schedule uh, 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 defines what, uh, what the gross income is, though it does not specifically mention it as gross income, but looking at the uh, what is included, emoluments, annuities, dividends, interest charges, and so on, uh, we assume this is a gross income. Then it also makes exemptions for certain persons as well as certain type of incomes. Uh, this is in section 15 of the Income Tax Act. The emoluments of the president, uh, the chiefs, as well as of, of uh, officials of foreign government, uh, foreign governments are excluded. Then in terms of income, uh, a pension received from a, an approved fund is excluded. Approved death, disability, injury, and sickness benefits are excluded. We do not have a capital gains tax in, in, in Zambia. And then you also they have uh, non-monetary fringe benefits are also excluded. Then we have uh, Mr. deductions. Mr. Nadishev, excuse me. You have, a, you have about five minutes to wrap up. OK, all right. Then we have uh, uh, deductions, a number of allowances, uh, numerous allowances, uh, as well as uh, 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 credits. Uh, in terms of the schedule uh, that is applied, uh, uh, are pretty much a standard. Uh, uh, part two of the charging schedule is um, uh, of the Income Tax Act specifies the, uh, uh, the rates. And the key issue in the design of the income tax rate structure is the uh, progressivity. Uh, we see that with the different tax bands, depending on, on the level of income, personal income tax is considered a progressive tax type. Then now we looked at how are all these things, after looking at the law, the design and the law, how are all these things uh, administered? And uh, the, the key ways of administering uh, uh, personal income tax in Zambia is through withholding 
on wages and salaries, uh, withholding on interest and dividends, as well as for, for the hard to tax, like uh, self-employment income, we have presumptive taxation. And then we also looked at the, uh, how the fringe benefits are treated. So with regard to uh, withholding on salaries, uh, what we found out uh, uh, mostly is, is that uh, uh, the, there's a steep um, marginal rate for exempt income. It moves from zero to 25%. And then uh, uh, the adjustments of the exempt, exempt bracket are not done on a regular basis. So this introduces the, uh, the bracket creep uh, particularly for low income earners. And that uh, basically has an impact on our progressivity. Uh, I think we can look at the, the, the actual details on this slide, but for the sake of time, I'll skip that. Then on our presumptive taxation, uh, the, 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 the Zambian tax authorities have a presumptive tax on passenger transport, as well as a base tax for uh, marketeers. But the sectors to which the presumptive tax is applied is quite uh, limited. And then uh, on uh, withholding, uh, we look when you look at the example that we gave, it has joint investments. Uh, the couple has jo these joint investments, uh, but it's not immediately clear how the joint investments are to be apportioned. Uh, it's, it's not very clear in the income tax law. And uh, what we uh, the, the the major finding uh, here is that the we have uh, lower marginal rates for the, for the withholding on interest and dividends compared to employment income, which is 37.5%, uh, which may cause some distortions. And then uh, with regard to fringe benefits, uh, what we found out is that the non-monetary benefits are not taxed in the Zambian uh, system. However, uh, there are some fringe benefits that could be reformed. So then uh, let me just quickly, uh, in the sh three minutes that I have, let me just quickly look at the proposals for reforms on the, on the, on the personal income tax. The first proposal that we, we look at is that the government should reduce the graduation of the marginal rate schedule and possibly index the thresholds to inflation. Uh, we could have a less a steeper uh, uh, rate after the exemption bracket, such as 15% to minimize uh, the tax burden because there, there are a lot of them that creep into the higher bracket. So that causes even a lot of administrative uh, issues uh, as well as a tax burden for, uh, for those, these low income earners. And then we need to broaden the scope of presumptive taxes to include other sectors that are not included, which are uh, predominantly informal, such as agriculture, construction, real estate activities, and activities of households as employers. Then uh, there's also a need to, margin, uh, to harmonize the marginal rates, which I talked about between employment income and the personal income tax. And then on fringe benefits, even though the, the non-monetary benefits are not taxed, uh, we feel that we, 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 we did quite some, uh, some analysis on this part. Like on the personal to holder vehicles, allowances are very widespread and uh, something can be done on this because they are not progressive and they are generally disproportionately provided to highly compensated employees already. So uh, there has to be some cost sharing mechanism and some of that, uh, those taxes paid by, uh, 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 by, these, uh, by these highly compensated employees. Uh, just to conclude, while the Hypothetical illustration is by no means exhaustive. It uh, stuff, uh, helps us to con contextualize the issues and it would help the policymakers and analysts to uncover the different aspects and the many bases and angles of the tax system. Uh, as I mentioned already, though only covering the personal income tax in this presentation, this framework was also applied for corporate income tax and mineral royalties. And then after that, some ex-ante assessments uh, were then applied to determine the impact of these proposals that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Narishevo, for that presentation and for being with us throughout the process. Uh,
we believe that uh, the, the, the outcomes of uh, these two exercises will play a significant role, not only in shaping uh, uh, the work of ECA forward in terms of looking at the tax regimes, uh, but also helping the countries uh, in, the, in the, tax, the various tax reforms with the aim of enhancing their tax revenues. Uh, I'm not sure if we, there are any questions we could be able to respond to if we have time, Penelope. Otherwise, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hopstone. That's really, I'm sure that the, the, the beneficiary countries uh, are very grateful for the depth and anal um, detail of the analysis done, um, as we've seen both from Professor Wawire and Mr. Nchilebo. It's really extraordinarily good work. Thank you very much. Um, what we do have time for um, is a discussion still by Francis Cairo, who we've invited from the tax justice network in Africa um, to give us a general discussion on uh, utilizing domestic uh, resource mobilization or taxation in dealing with um, the, the, the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, Francis, over to you, uh, and then we'll close the session. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I will uh, beg to share my presentation and uh, um, I will try to stick to time uh, because I know we are past time. And uh, my name is Francis Cairo uh, with the Tax Justice Network Africa. Um, and I am a policy officer uh, currently focusing on tax and the international financial architecture. And the Tax Justice Network um, is a network of, uh, is a Pan-African uh, organization that has currently um, at least 40 members uh, who are all organizations that have an interest um, or are currently working on tax justice issues across Africa. And uh, I will not dwell a lot on the context um, uh, because I know this has been spoken to by the other presenters. Uh, uh, but just a few things here. Um, um, statistics from 2018, uh, looking at uh, tax as a percentage of GDP uh, uh, globally, uh, ranked uh, Africa as having the lowest tax to GDP percentage. Um, that was 2018 before the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, this must have declined uh, uh, by now. And uh, in addition to uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, just thinking about uh, the, the current levels of debt uh, across Africa. And uh, we know that currently most countries are now in the market. Uh, looking for a mix uh, of debt through sovereign bonds, uh, syndicated and commercial loans. And uh, we can currently say that uh, uh, at least uh, a few countries now have actually crossed uh, the 100% mark uh, in their debt to GDP ratio. Um, just thinking about that, uh, uh, is uh, actually a, a troubling issue. But then we think about the options we have um, uh, in terms of financing our development. One is receiving aid, but we know that aid is currently dwindling. Uh, and uh, the other option is to uh, continue you know, borrowing um, and the, uh, our debt levels, as I mentioned, and as others have mentioned, are, are growing our, our debt to GDP ratio. Uh, we are currently having very many countries across Africa ranked as a, in either high risk of debt distress or currently in debt distress. And just thinking about uh, how vicious a cycle of debt is, um, is really concerning. And the other option is to explore uh, public-private partnerships. I personally like to call them profit, 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 
or uh, poison, poison, poison. Uh, uh, because where they have been implemented across most African countries, um, it's been lost uh, in terms of uh, uh, even availing resources locally. And uh, um, uh, most of the uh, companies engaged in PPP projects, um, you will find contracts that were negotiated secretively, um, uh, formations that are, um, are constituted to take away as much resources as possible, and you end up with a, a little development, a loss of uh, revenue, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, projects that the government is unable to maintain. And then we come to the last option, which is a domestic resource mobilization, uh, which is what we like talking about. And uh, I, I, I like sharing this photo because I remember uh, recently we were in one room with the uh, civil society organizations um, and, and government officials talking about DRM. And uh, we asked in the context of one country, in terms of development for this country, what should the country focus on uh, in terms of, for example, achieving the SDGs? And uh, it was either agriculture or mining. And uh, you could see the clear divide between the government saying we should focus on mining uh, because of uh, you know, uh, the ability of the government to levy and uh, 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 get revenue out of mining. And then the citizens and the CSO say, no, it's agriculture because one, it avails food for us and because it is hard for the government to tax agriculture. So uh, just thinking about that, um, uh, I was actually, uh, you know, a good a good way of thinking about DRM uh, as one of the options for financing development across Africa, and uh, uh, and not just financing development, but our view as a tax justice network is that apart from tax availing the government with the possibility or with the uh, uh, availability of resources to finance development. Taxation also offers government the ability to provide key and crucial public services, whether it is health, or whether it is the provision of education, uh, or other things like water. And uh, uh, as it is now, um, it is impossible to continue as is relying on aid uh, or debt to be able to finance public services. And uh, the options there now then uh, mean that we have as African nations to focus on promoting economic activity uh, to grow our tax base and ensure that we are engaging in tax reforms that help us to boost our local revenues. And um, uh, just thinking about the current challenges to domestic resource mobilization, I know that most of these have been mentioned. They, uh, and I think the example from Zambia where the, the, the poor are paying more than the rich or the rich have uh, with them uh, the possibility of paying less tax uh, for money that they are earning. So inefficient, uh, ineffective tax system, a major challenge to DRM. Uh, tax exemptions, uh, which have been mentioned, you know, tax holidays, um, uh, granting a, a profit-making companies 10 years tax holidays uh, without really thinking about what um, that will impact on the ability of the country to raise its revenue. Uh, the digital sector has been mentioned and uh, uh, definitely the issue of illicit financial flows. And uh, just uh, talking a little bit uh, about tax exemptions, I'll give the examples uh, from three countries and uh, one Southern African country, one in East Africa and one in West Africa. Uh, we are currently together with our partners challenging um, uh, of a generous tax incentives or exemptions that have been granted by government. Um, and in one instance, uh, uh, the government gave one entity exclusive rights to mine iron ore, and then give them exclusive rights to manage, uh, you know, an exclusive access to railway infrastructure ostensibly to be able to move iron ore from one area to another or from the mines to the port. In another instance, the government has granted exclusive titanium mining rights to one, one entity 
um, which is actually bringing nothing to the table. And, and I think in the context of the energy transition, uh, we all know that uh, um, you know titanium uh, is one of the crucial minerals that uh, uh, you know will uh, portend either an opportunity for African countries to raise revenue or lose much more revenue through the extractive industry. And then the other most interesting example closer to us is this uh, a company uh, which is shrouded in mystery that was granted exclusive rights to purchase coffee uh, at a price they would set. And uh, in this instance, crowding out all other players that uh, either uh, you know, market or trade in coffee within the country. And uh, what was interesting in that instance is that even parliament itself, um, which has sided with the executive uh, previously, uh, was in this instance actually uh, up in arms against the executive because of that deal, serious issues. Um, but then the other challenge is the digital sector. Uh, we all remember that uh, towards the end of last year, uh, uh, the OECD uh, through the inclusive framework uh, led a process where uh, countries came together to discuss a global tax deal. And one of our main oppositions the, as the Tax Justice Network to that deal was that it was taking away the right of African countries or most countries to tax, to levy tax in the digital sector without then availing them an opportunity to recoup the revenue losses. That deal is currently uh, you know, undergoing uh, different discussions to develop the rules for implementation. But I think that how that deal will be implemented will be crucial in determining whether African countries are going to be able to realize enough revenue from the digital sector. And it is instructive to note that the two countries that have had uh, 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 the digital services tax in whatever format, Kenya and Nigeria, led in the process of rejecting you know, the deal from Africa. Um, and uh, as we draw to a conclusion, uh, thinking about the abusive practices of multinationals, uh, the State of Tax Justice uh, report, which is published by the Tax Justice Network every year, um, last year as, uh, uh, gave statistics that countries are currently losing about $483 billion a year through global tax abuse. And it is instructive to note that from that amount, 80% is actually linked directly to global tax abuse being perpetrated by multinationals. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, thinking about this, and this has been mentioned, um, is that MNEs by themselves, they have the ability, number one, to engage in tax avoidance schemes, to operate through complicated corporate structures and to domicile themselves in a way where their tax liabilities within uh, you know, most developing countries are lessened to the um, bare minimum. And uh, this has been mentioned that uh, actually uh, PIT is contributing much more to tax revenue than CIT uh, knowing very well that companies by themselves could be generating more revenue as an entity than all the employees employed within that organization or within that entity. And, and therefore, uh, in thinking about how do we then improve the importance of taxation as a pillar uh, for financing the achievement of the SDGs, I think number one is thinking about how natural resource contracts are negotiated. Uh, things like stabilization clauses, uh, things like the tax holidays, uh, the tax incentives that are granted at the point when natural resource contracts are being negotiated. I think it will be crucial for African nations to ensure that mineral resource contracts are negotiated in a way that allows enough revenue to be raised from that sector. Additionally, uh, the issue of tax incentives, which has been mentioned, uh, uh, I, I think, very well by the other presenters, the loss carryovers, the tax holidays that are over generous, uh, that are often negotiated uh, you know, uh, in secret, I think it will be crucial. Eliminating IFFs, uh, looking at issues like offshore accounts, 
that are held by uh, you know um, uh, people in high-ranking government uh, offices, offshore accounts that are operated by multinationals, um, and I think ensuring that multinationals are paying their fair amount of tax will be crucial in helping us ensure that DRM is playing the role, the important role that it will it should play in helping us finance development. And lastly, the issue of how international tax rules are set, how they are negotiated, and the role that African countries are playing at the discussion table when international rules are being developed and discussed. And our proposal has been a UN tax convention would help in ensuring that countries have equal say, have an equal uh, opportunity to uh, contribute towards the development of international uh, tax rules. And uh, recently, I think the African finance uh, uh, ministers uh, meeting in Dakar uh, endorsed uh, you know, the report from the committee of experts calling on the UN to start off the process of uh, negotiating a UN tax convention. As I conclude, um, I think the main issue will be uh, for us moving forward is ensuring that we come up with tax policies that work to avail more resources domestically, that work to reduce the loss of tax revenue, that ensure that multinationals are paid their fair amount of tax. And like this toilet that I am showing here, uh, it, is, it is of no use to you know, install a modern toilet uh, and build no walls around it, even though it has piped water and uh, uh, probably underneath it are very connected to the sewer system, but no walls around it. Uh, it will be crucial in how we reform our tax policies to ensure that they work, uh, they net the necessary um, uh, revenues and lead us to uh, availing more resources uh, from DRM. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. I think that was a, a very useful uh, regional and perhaps a global view on um, these very important and yet vexing issues. Um, but as I said before, and as Hopeson and uh, Shebo and Nelson have already explained to us, um, there is much that can be done. Um, some of it is actually fairly obvious and I think could be done with minimal engagement. And um, it's really, once again, we'd like to thank ECA for taking on this important area of work, which I think as um, both yourself, Francis, and Hopestone have framed very well as um, crucial for us to address not only the SDGs, but also structural transformation in Africa. So thank you very much. I don't know, um, we have, with your indulgence, engaged into the break time already. Um, are there any questions? If you could raise your hand or turn on your screen, uh, you'd be most welcome to do so. Otherwise, I will close the session. Um, thanking everyone involved yet again, and thank you for the participation, for those who've um, been with us through this, these very interesting presentations. And I would invite you to join us again at 2.30 this afternoon uh, for the afternoon sessions, um, which begin, first of all, with a discussion on financial tools um, that have been de developed within the project, including the financial um, uh, sorry, the financial conditions indicator, the new generation financial in, uh, con conditions indicator and the global financial safety net tracker. And then we will have a panel this afternoon, which will gauge specifically on some of the work that's come out of the ECLAC um, co coordinators. So thank you very much. And um, we'll see you then. Once again, please do feel free to respond to the survey if you get it on exit now. Otherwise, we will email you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.